So good evening, welcome, and welcome back to Blair for this, the 168th year in the life of our school. My name is Mr. Powell, I'm the new school chaplain. I'm thrilled to welcome you here for this event, Convocation, which formally marks both the end of the summer and the beginning of a new school year. So when preparing my, I promise, very brief remarks for tonight, I thought about, well, convocation. That is, the very word, convocation. Interestingly, the word convocation is rooted in a distinctly religious meaning. I know, surprise, surprise, the chaplain wants to talk about religion. But hear me out, think for a second about convocation. We, of course, recognize the root word, vocation, meaning what someone does, as in someone's job or career. Yet the word vocation once denoted a specifically religious career. Way back in the Middle Ages, actually, if someone were to join a monastery, they'd say they found their vocation. This is because the word vocation stems from the Latin vocare, which means to call. So when someone found their vocation hundreds, maybe thousands of years ago, they believed they'd found their calling, the thing God had called them to do, the thing they were created to do, in fact. Yet we're here for convocation, and the con is important to note. Con means together. It means with. This, as I understand it, means we're not only gathered here tonight to inaugurate the beginning of a new school year, a year when we'll seek out our calling and the things or thing that calls most to us, but we'll do this all together in the context of a community. And ours is a diverse community. Not only do we have students from nearly half the American states, but we have in our midst students from around the globe. You perhaps saw these students carrying flags from their home country while processing here tonight. These include Afghanistan, and Germany, Jamaica, and Spain, Saudi Arabia and Australia, Bermuda and Hong Kong, Benin and Thailand, Nigeria and Dubai, the Cayman Islands and Sweden, Turkey and Kazakhstan, Japan and China, the United Kingdom, and Vietnam, Singapore and Switzerland, Austria, and South Korea. So welcome to Convocation, this time where with, many, with our many voices we commence together on this journey of acquiring new knowledge and understanding in a new school year. So I'll now invite up Mr. Fortunato who will introduce the members of the Senior Class Council speaking for you tonight. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. As has been a long-standing tradition at Blair, I'm very delighted and proud to introduce to you two of your fellow students, members of the Senior Class Council, who will welcome you today uh, to the opening of the school year officially. Uh, the students are Eric Marcus and Kendall Fitzgerald, and we'll start with Kendall. When I've been asked to define Blair, I've never known how to do it justice. The only way I can think to define Blair is through the people. Blair is incredibly friendly. Everyone knows this. Everyone waves, everyone smiles, everyone holds doors. At Blair, everyone is molded into a perfectly friendly and caring person. But to every person, there is far more. Imagine you're in a museum, and there's a marble statue. A whitewash, charming marble shell. However, this statue doesn't show the color of this person's eyes, or their emotions. The people of Blair have so much more to give than their marble smiles. They have their voice to share. What I love about Blair is hearing those voices. What I love about Blair is breaking past talking about the weather, the dining hall food, or schedules. Because no one can show their personality when they're talking about what class they have C-block. Over my three years, I've noticed that my fondest and most genuine connections 
are with those whom I teetered on friendship with, who I smiled at, but then actually got to know. Whether it was a senior on my tennis team, one of my old teachers, or a prefect down the, fall, down the hall, I found that we only really bonded when we became really personal. Each year, I've been able to open up to and get to know new people like this. My freshman year, I wasn't very close to my big sister, Sierra. For the entire year, we were both just a little bit too quiet to strike up a great friendship. It wasn't until the spring of that year that I ended up in her room with a really random mix of girls. Someone found a ukulele, and soon talking turned into singing, and singing into laughter. Within an hour, we had all become really good friends, and Sierra waited for me the next day for practice, and we laughed across the quad together as real sisters. My sophomore year, there was a really funny, nice group of guys living on the third floor of East. And my friends and I knew them, but we weren't really close to them. One night, after slipping and sliding in the pouring rain, we were inspired to go mudsliding, and we asked the boys to come with us. Soon, we were throwing ourselves down the front hill as fast as we could for a half hour, and we made it back to East with scrapes and cuts and shorts that were so soggy and dirty that we had to change into borrowed athletic clothes. And I'll never forget the look on Mr. Cameron's face when he saw 12 kids caked in mud and dirt and worms. <laughs> we were kicked, kicked out of the dorm and laughed across the quad to hang out in the can. After that night, we were all officially friends. My junior year, my best friend came in to ask, if I, to ask if I wanted to go sledding. It had been a pretty rough week, and she knew that I needed to get away from my desk. So we wandered aimlessly around the campus in snow and in soggy sweatshirts for what felt like an eternity until we finally found a group of kids in our grade who were sledding on the golf course hills. I practically tackled the first kid I saw because I was so happy to see him. And we stayed out there until all of our layers were soaked and all of our fingers were numb. But still, on the way back, Wyatt Long managed to get his tongue stuck to a light pole. <laughs> Again, we laughed across the, across the quad and collapsed on the each couches as a family. Because Blair is always full of fun and fascinating people, you'll never stop making new friends. The only thing that might be in your way might be like a veil of shyness or awkwardness. If I can get one message across, it's to push past that to reach out and become close to these friend crushes. They might be crushing right back. Because chances are they would love to get to know you too. So be open to anything, everyone. When I reached out, I found my Blair family, the people who give me the most support and have given me the best nights of my life. So if you don't really know that prefect down the hall very well, go hang out with her for an hour. If it's pouring rain outside, don't sit in your room. Go mudsliding. And if it's snowing, Put homework aside and go sledding. Take any opportunity you're given. Here we rely on each other, even the people who may not be our closest friends, to make us laugh both on our best days and on our worst days. That's what makes Blair feel like home. And those are the people who will define Blair for you. Thank you. to the 2015-2016 school year. Now that we've all moved in, said our hellos, and our starting classes soon, we're beginning to get back into the groove. For most of us, this feels like coming home. Going to the dining hall the second it opens, crowding nine people around a table in the can, falling asleep on the library, com on the comfy chairs in the library. The only people to whom these things are familiar are the new people of Blair. They wander aimlessly around the Blair campus trying to get a lay of land figure out how to live alone and worrying about their acne. Uh, and I'm just talking about the new faculty. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> this year, we, um, we embrace brand new teachers, young faces such as Ms. Backer, Ms. Hall, Reverend Powell, Mr. Goggins. Um, <laughs> um, really, um, Mr. Powell, the last time 
I saw you last year, and I really actually thought you worked for Rustic Pathways, actually. <laughs> 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 It's going to offer me like a trip to go zip lining in Ecuador or something. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, when I was meeting these new, new teachers, I thought of something that made me kind of feel weird. The thought was that I know more about this school than, than the new teachers do. That I've spent more time here than they have. By now, I'm old to these, these halls. And soon, I'll be leaving them. And looking back on my time in these halls, I feel love for Blair. Every grade has been a unique adventure, every class a new challenge, every pay today a devoted competition. And still, every so often while walking around campus, I just can't hold back a smile. Though throughout my time here, I've sometimes heard people complain about the minor inconveniences about Blair. Why can't I use my phone on campus? Why do I have a structured study hall? Why do I get 13 more emails from Mr. Adams every time I finish reading his last six? <laughs> After these complaints usually comes, Blair's so annoying. Blair's the worst. I hate Blair. I'm shocked whenever I hear this because I love Blair. And while I can understand where some of these complaints come from, I think it's important we remind ourselves that all these amazing things, of all the amazing things we have on this campus. Because sometimes when we scrutinize over the little things, we forget about the big. We forget the good times. When we complain about Blair's little imperfections, we overlook all the friends we made here, all the teachers we've loved here, all the amazing nights we've spent here. We need to remember that these wonderful experiences are what Blair is made of. And sometimes we can take these things for granted. But we must remind ourselves that every great experience we've had here is Blair. Experiences like becoming friends with your friend crush, like having a blast ahead matter, at Headmasters, like battling on Petty Day, and the great experiences don't even have to be that big. They can, they can be listening to music on campus. They can be playing ping pong in the can. They can be eating a Bodini. All these things are Blair. And we need to remind ourselves not to take Blair for granted. We need to remind ourselves to treat Blair with love. Let's remind ourselves that because of Blair, we have some of the virtues, memories, and people we most cherish. So the next time you see the Blair flag snapping atop the flagpole, remind yourself that the crest doesn't stand for the dress code. It stands for your best friends. It doesn't stand for midterms. It stands for some of the best times of your life. It doesn't even stand for Mr. Fortunato. That crest stands for you. It stands for us. So the next time a friend from home asks you, hey, how's Blair? Don't think of those little inconveniences. Think of the arch. Think of your friends. Think of the good times. Then answer, Blair's great. Thank you.
welcome again. It is my pleasure to officially open Blair's 168th year. I've always loved beginnings, the start of things. I think it's because of all the possibilities, seeing so many new faces and ideas that are added to the chorus of those that have come before. And I'm especially excited to think about all that is yet to come, what the 530 or so of us in this room will achieve together in the year ahead, the friendships and the fellowships that are going to form. I grew up loving stories, often epic stories in particular, which from their first moments immediately captured my heart and my imagination and made me believe that there was truly something great ahead on the horizon. And being of the generation that I was born into, from the time I was five, in my head, I have to be honest, every important beginning in my life has felt like it should be accompanied by the following. Raz? A little dramatic, I understand. And I'm thinking, though, perhaps some of you have had your own theme songs in your head playing at different important times in your life. I, alas, am still trying to figure out why Mrs. Fortunato would let me play this at our wedding, <laughs> or in the delivery room with Maddie and Katie. But I have to say that I was kind of secretly hearing it in my head anyway. Okay. So at this time of beginning, when we both reaffirm who we are, and yet have the opportunity to reinvent ourselves as individuals and as a school, I'd like to take a moment to draw from some of the life lessons, the truths that I've learned from a couple of the stories I grew up with. The ones that made me dream and think and laugh and start to figure out what's important even from an early age. There are lessons I've discovered as an adult now that the messages from those stories make more sense to be the foundations of a good life. The lessons that I can think that I think can set the stage for a great experience at Blair, and that can guide us well on the adventure that lies ahead in year 168. I share with you right from the start a most important lesson that I've learned thus far. The real prize that lies ahead for you, for all of us, at Blair and beyond, is in fact a good life. And a good life depends more than anything on the people we let enter into our worlds. It's not just about where you go to college or your grades or how many hash marks you have in your win-loss column, how many awards you accumulate or don't. I'm not saying those things don't matter and that they don't contribute to a good life, but your lives will be and must be bigger than just where you were admitted to school or the recognitions you receive. So as your head of school and as a faculty, we start this year wanting to affirm to you that we are above all committed to preparing you, guiding, listening, walking alongside you on the path to a good life in the many forms that it's going to take for each one of you as individuals. That means being with you and behind you through all the successes and the stumbles, the challenges, anxieties, the late night conversations in the common room, the seemingly impossible calculus tests, the I got admitted or I got waitlisted, the roommate arguments and tough losses, the great performances, the grill and chills, the really long bus rides from Mercersburg, the seemingly how could I have been so stupid moments, the I nailed the public speaking competition, the we just beat petty moment, which will come in how many days, Mr. Evans? 61. 61. <laughs> we'll be there for all of those and everything in between. Oh, look, I have a bug. <laughs> Bad sign. All right. <laughs> We'll go. So here I submit to you my particular truth. Three things from the stories of my childhood that I've come to understand form the foundation of a good life. And they are these. Belief, family, and love. There are three things I ask you to keep in your thoughts as you march into this school year. They're, uh, they're things that I've found in abundance at Blair and make the Blair experience pretty special. So what do I mean by these things? Belief family, and love. Before I talk about them, I suppose I should, of course, identify at least a couple of the stories that influence my truth. I have no doubt figured out the first one, yes, from the opening fanfare you've gathered, that I have been an obsessive fan of, let's see, Star Wars. Since 1977, as a five-year-old, I saw the movie at least 
ten times in the movie theaters. Back in a mythical time before TV, excuse me, before cable TV and DVDs. Not before TV. <laughs> Netflix or smartphones, or actually even before cordless phones. So I dreamed as a five-year-old of being Luke Skywalker, or Han Solo, and wanted to believe there was an all-powerful force bigger than any one person that compelled people to do good or bad. I share the following visual testimony to make clear the level of my obsession, both as a child <laughs> and as an adult. Those are Maddie and Katie in their earlier days. There are about 101 days, 4 hours, and about 30 minutes before the opening night of the next Star Wars movie, which I'm thinking I might just go check out. Now, the other stories that I'm going to reference existed on a less galactic scale, but nonetheless felt pretty epic to me as a kid. They're about a band of simple animals led by an unassuming, amiable little leader named Winnie the Pooh. And of course, a boy named Christopher, a name with which I, I identified, who banded together and they stuck by each other like family through the trials and tribulations of being carried away by balloons, getting stuck in honeypots, and tracking a mysterious heffalump creature. <laughs> and by the way, it was a fanboy's delight to find out that an artist brought these two iconic stories from my childhood together in his paintings. <laughs> so seeing this was like, it was like witnessing the greatest crossover since. God, how could I think about this in Blair terms? Um, it would be like having Doc Miller and Mr. Brandwood teaching the same class together. <laughs> I'm not sure what that class would be. I don't know if it would be Shakespeare in the Economy or the Poetry of Global Markets or something like that. <laughs> well, that joke killed with my kids earlier. <laughs> All right, let's, let, me, let me start by talking about belief. In some ways, there's nothing more powerful than belief. Believing in oneself in something bigger than oneself, believing in others, and in the ability to create new things, to change others' lives, to do things we didn't think was possible. As a kid, I remember the excitement that came from watching Luke Skywalker fly through a trench to destroy the Death Star, hopelessly outmatched, with a Darth Vader about to blast him into pieces, and a voice telling him in his head to believe and trust in his ability to do the impossible. That was magical stuff for a five-year-old. Or a reading with fascination and joy about Winnie the Pooh and his band of followers having faith that they could trap that heffalump, a creature they knew nothing about, even didn't know if it existed or not. But they believed together that their friends could come together and they could do anything. I'm 43 years old now, and my thinking more sophisticated and informed, or at least I like to think, than my five-year-old self. But one thing I refuse to let change is being a believer. A believer that if you surround yourself with the right people, and give yourself fully to what you want to achieve, there is little you cannot do. There is that feeling we all get when we truly believe in something, whether you're five or whether you're 55. But frankly, it gets harder as you get older, sometimes to really cre recreate or feel that feeling. It's because it's hard to be a believer these days. So often the messages and the modeling we're bombarded with all around us from our leaders, our media, it's cynical. And it focuses on cutting people down critiquing to the point of dissection, as opposed to creating things, inventing things, or building other people up. In fact, so often, so often there is rhetoric, information, or misinformation from people or organizations that make it such that we don't even know what to believe. And when that happens, it's simply easy to not believe in anything at all. As we start this year, we're delving more deeply, as all of you know, into the next presidential election cycle. And we're already mired in and a bit depressed by self-centered, mean-spirited double-talk that masquerades as leadership in action. But let me tell you why I am still a believer now. It's simple. It's because of all of you. It's because of us. You've heard this already. Blair is far from perfect. None of us are or will be perfect. But getting to know you, and that goes for students, faculty, staff, parents, others in this community, seeing who you are and what you're capable of, oh, the friendships and the kindness that you show, your resilience and humor, your willingness to help others, it makes me believe with the same kind of overflowing kinetic energy with which I believed in the Force when I was five. We have something pretty special here. And so I both affirm the gift and issue the collective challenge for us to believe and to act together on our beliefs. I will never presume to tell you exactly what your beliefs should be or what things you should stand for. With one another's help, you'll figure those things out. But I will ask you to do your best to have faith in each other. 
In a sometimes jaded world, we need believers who are willing to try, who have faith that there is more in life than just what's in front of them in the moment, who look to challenges and don't walk away, who are builders, creators, and innovators. Honestly, that's what's going to get you ahead in life. That's what will add to your life. So what does this all mean practically? It means with the support of the people around you, who believe in you and will take care of you, take leaps of faith, take the smart risks to learn and grow and get better at stuff. The belief that people have in you and their commitment to you here to stand by you is power. It gives you power to take on things that are challenging. So if you've never run cross country or road crew but want to try them, do it. If you want to build a prototype for an object in the makerspace and never even play with Legos as a kid, just do it. Don't shy away. If you've never painted at all in your life and want to try a hand in art, go see Mrs. Sykes. If there are people who you don't know and want to get, to get to know but can't figure out how to do it, go talk to Mrs. Conforti or your housemaster or your advisor. If you want to create a service trip, go grab Mr. Beck. If you want to take Greek, go see Mr. Newell. If you want, go to the people here, ask for their help, advice, and partnership, and then just go ahead and do it. As a faculty, it's our obligation to give you help to help to dream and believe and create. And shockingly, what you do will not be perfect. Dare I say you will make your share of mistakes. So go ahead and make the best mistakes you possibly can. Now that's not an open invitation to be foolish or reckless or ignore the rules or common sense. But it is a charge to you that we believe in you so much that we know you can make mistakes, overcome them, and succeed. And you will not do it alone. Which brings me to family. Some say it's a cliche to talk about a school community as a family. I do not. I do not believe that at all. More than any place I've worked, I've seen at Blair a commitment to one another, to friendship and family that makes a difference, that means something. Again, we're not perfect, but I can proudly say that when people in this community have been down or in need, we so often rally around them. When people are injured, when people band together to help raise money for those in need, when we raised $30,000, for Relay for Life last year, doubling what Petty had raised the year before. <laughs> yeah, you can clap for that. <laughs> it's the doing things together that is ultimately the key to success in our world today. Solving problems that we couldn't solve entirely on our own and navigating past disagreements, differences, or challenges to do it. Is that meant to say that I'm done? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. That's our world now. The world that you're going to enter more fulsomely in college and beyond. The world we need to prepare you for. So it's critical for you to be there for each other. To foster trust and act like a team. It's ultimately pretty satisfying as well. And the, all, and the way we can all make a difference, both inside and out of our Blair bubble. Part of being at Blair means embracing an obligation. Yes, an obligation to one another. And I suppose the easiest, most direct thing to do is ask you to do the following. Be good to each other. Faculty, staff, students, let us be good to each other. See the best and bring out the best in one another. Though there may be moments of annoyance or when we fall down on the job, it is a gift to be part of more than just the family that raised you. You know what my absolute favorite moment of any Star Wars movie was, and you knew this was coming. In that scene I described where the Death Star is about to be destroyed and Luke Skywalker is in the trench, his friend Han Solo, we all thought had selfishly gone off and done something to take care of himself. He flies in, rescues the situation, and helps his friend save the day. It was such a cool and powerful message for me as a kid. One that you see reinforced maybe even up in that picture there. When you think about what people can do together when they don't give up on each other. I appreciate much of our culture outside our bubble doesn't always reflect or celebrate the sense of obligation to others. But remember this, that doesn't mean that people aren't counting on you. We're all counting on you. We're counting on each other. So be good to each other. This is your team and your community. At our best, this is family. And even if much of the rest of the world is not caught up with where we are in embracing community in one another, it just means we need to lead the way. Love. Back at graduation, I told our seniors to remember that a good life is ultimately about love. Love of learning, self, family and friends. You know, it's important that these are not just parting words from Blair, but words we live by. And so I share them again now to open our year. Love is ultimately the reason that most of us do what we do. 
why we strive to be successful, to make a difference and do things that are important. It's why we dare to fight the dark side. It's why we adventure through the woods, tolerating our Eeyores, protecting our piglets, marveling at our Tiggers, and su hopefully supported by your Christophers, and how we all stick together. It's the reason we push past our limits, take risks, and dare to share our stories. And you all start this year from a place of being loved by those who launch you into it. Your parents and your families, your relatives, your friends, your faculty, and your headmaster who believe in you. So I've told you why I believe. But before I close, I've asked a few of my colleagues to come up here and do the same. For me, what's most beautiful about this Blair community is the constant opportunity for self-reflection and personal growth. There are so many loving and positive people here that it's nearly impossible to go through a day without feeling supported and nurtured, sometimes even too much. And I say this from the faculty perspective as well. Just a few days ago, I was extremely stressed out about moving into my new apartment during preseason. Uh, I had been between apartments for nearly a month, and when we finally got the go-ahead to move in, there was fresh paint on the staircase in my apartment. So I couldn't really do any of the things that I was planning on doing that day. And I was so excited to finally move in. It sounds silly, because it was, but this was a bit of a breaking point for me. I hopped right on the train to Negative Town. <laughs> so cut to our pool practice a few minutes later, where I met the field hockey uh, girls, my team, for our second annual synchronized swimming Olympics. <laughs> yes. I walked into the pool so stressed out that day, and I was in a negative place, and they could tell. They could feel my energy. But 30 minutes later, after sharing a bunch of laughs with them and watching some of the most ridiculous synchronized swimming ever, I was a whole new person, and I thank them for that. Being with my team in that moment reminded me that positivity is all about perspective and being present enough in the moment to appreciate the people around you. This is Blair. Hello all. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Miss D. Hi, Hi Leah. <laughs> <laughs> and for those of you who don't know me well, I'm probably best known for being far too cheerful and far too positive far too much of the time. On a consistent basis, people ask me how I stay so optimistic all the time. But the truth is, it's not so hard to stay positive while being in a place as special as Blair. I would argue that the things that truly make this place special are the experiences that are more everyday occurrences than true hallmark moments. These are the moments when Shane Brackup finds you in the dining hall, asks you how your day is, and genuinely wants to know the answer. Or when you overhear John Patton's students on the Lindsay porch talking about the class topic of that day, still, hours later, or when you see Cy Lippold get crazy excited over an amazing math pro um, problem, or even when you witness Felix's infamous prom -posal. <laughs> <laughs> You'll hear about it if you haven't already. <laughs> but ironically, the one hallmark moment that may be the most optimistic about Blair is actually a rather upsetting one. As many of you remember, last year during a basketball game, Brie Kavanaugh sustained a terrifying concussion which left her out of school for several weeks. It was perhaps the scariest moment of my life, and I know several people echo that same sentiment. However, what came of this awful in incident ended up being beautiful. From the moment Brie fell, through the moment she stepped back on campus, the entire Blair community came together to support her. Close friends and foreign acquaintances sent her texts and flowers. People who barely knew her would constantly ask how she was, at school meeting, Q would update us on her status, and everyone would cheer like crazy, and it truly felt as though everybody knew someone was missing. In my whole life, I've never seen a whole community collectively care about so much about one of their own. In that stretch of time, I truly felt the shift from community to family. It was something really special, and I finally understood that when push comes to shove, Blair truly is a family. And how can you not be positive about that?
I love what I do at Blair because of my interactions with many different groups outside of my students. If you believe absolutely in the concept that beyond self is happiness, then the prefects at Blair make this school a welcoming and home-like community where, as one of Lockhall prefects this year said, wonderful friendships are formed. Lockhall is where I get to go each week and miss my own children just a little bit less, even though they are 31, 28, and 25 and live in Australia, Philadelphia, and San Francisco, respectively. I still miss them a lot. Year after year, though, I am amazed by the Locke prefects who embody family and fun and often make the dorm a scene from Maurice Sendak's classic children's book, Where the Wild Things Are. <laughs> I hope you remember the line uttered after Max has been exiled to his room. Let the wild rumpus start. That is how I often feel when the bell rings at 10 p.m. and the girls rush to the common room for a Just Dance competition or to the hallways for a video or a photo shoot. Yes, there are quieter moments when last year's prefect, for example, prefect par excellence, Grace Ewells, would play Uno with the girls in the hall. Grace is just one example of the seniors who have sacrificed their time, left behind their groups of peers, to embrace a host of younger Blair brothers and sisters. Thank you. Sorry. What's up, yo? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Having a bad hair day, it's not good. Uh, a little more than a year ago, I was living the California dream. I had everything I could possibly want. I was playing a sport for a living, I fell in love, adopted the most adorable puppy, and lived in one of the most beautiful cities in the country. At the time, I was unaware that I was about to become the oldest freshman boy to grace the halls of Blair Academy. <laughs> I arrived at 3 a.m. after driving across the country on a Saturday morning and awoke to the alarm of my mother calling at 7 a.m. to inform me that she had arrived. Like many of the boys a few days ago, Mommy orchestrated the movement. <laughs> she stocked my fridge with all my favorite goodies, took me shopping for preppy clothes, <laughs> and served as the interior decorator for my new digs. During my send-off dinner at the end at Mill Race Pond, I cried and begged my mother to let me go back to California. <laughs> as I drove back to Blair, I resented being here. I felt alone, overwhelmed, and nostalgic for my old life. When I pulled up this year, I felt happy to be home. Over the course of the last year, I became a happier, healthier, and a better person. It may have been seeing Joe Mantegna's care for his team induce tears on stage. It may have been the unrelenting support I received from the entire English department uh, whenever I needed advice on teaching or a good laugh. It may be Jim Moore's passion for squash, which is only exceeded by his passion for nice suits and matching hats. <laughs> it may have been when Teddy Wenner and Carl Mazza consistently invited me into their family so I didn't have to eat dinner alone. It may have been crying on Mr. Newell's shoulder several times through personal hardship. It may just be John Patton's hair. <laughs> it was all these things, but it was the care, the support, the passion, the sense of family, and the friends I have made as a member of the Blair community that transformed me into a better version of myself. Just like the Lost Boys retaught Peter Pan to fly, the Flight the Deck boys helped bring out the inner freshman in me and ironically caused me to grow in more ways than I could possibly imagine. Do we feel the love? Do we not feel the love? Uncomfortable talking about love, 14 year olds? <laughs> okay, love. 
The emotion of love we're talking about is like loving your mother, loving when your grandmother brushes your hair. <laughs> walks to his cookie jar and eats 17 cookies. <laughs> that's the of love, but that's actually not what we're talking about. We're talking about love as a choice. Okay, every day we can all make the choice to love. Obviously you're gonna love your mother, you're gonna love chocolate chip cookies, you might fall in love for 10 days with, with a fellow Blair student. <laughs> every day we all have the choice choice to love, the choice to be decent, the choice to be compassionate, the choice to be empathetic. So don't get it twisted, okay? The emotion of love is different than the choice of love. I hope you guys all make great choices about that all year. Thank you. It's very clear that everything I do gets a whole lot better when I invite my friends to be a part of it. So thank you guys. So my friends, before we go and embark on a year that I think is going to be awesome and fun and exciting, and as with all things in life, it's going to pose its own challenges, I remind you that we're here to help you discover what you love in the world and share your world with those that you love. Seniors. Seniors in nine short months, I'll remind you of the following. But for all of us right now, for this year, I want to end with a piece of advice that I learned from a little bear talking to his friends in the woods. Whenever there are moments that we're not together, there is something you must always remember. You are braver than you believe stronger than you seem, and smarter than you think. But the most important thing is even when we're apart, we'll always be with you. Let's have a great year. Thank you. So, as is custom, I'll close tonight with a word on promise and hope for the year to come. As we leave convocation, thankful for the friendships reunited after a long summer, as well as for the new relationships kindled just in the past few days. We ask for the, bear, the very best in the day ahead, for humor in our strivings, and lightness when struggles find us. We leave here with a firm hope that in 2015 and 2016, we'll each work hard, do our best, and act in such a way that our finest selves might find their footing to stand in the days, weeks, and months to come. Seniors first.